And we welcome you back to Auburndale, Florida for Game 2 between New Jersey City and the Emerson College Lions here on Gothic Vision. NJCU took Game 1 14-1 in 7 innings. These are both 7 inning contests today. And we'll see if the Gothic Knights can go to 3-0 on the year as they take on Emerson in the third game of this spring trip. Three games the rest of this week. Thank the Kafers for a bottle of water here, which I desperately need after doing three games in two cities separated by 200 miles today. And uh, see if we can get through seven more innings and 28 total today. Ah, finally a drink. And we will give you the lineup here for both teams as Nate Facey, as the Gothic Knights. Now the home team after being the away team in game one. They changed uniforms. And Nate Facey will be the starting pitcher for the Gothic Knights. We've changed the score bug to represent that this is indeed game two. Except for one little thing I'm realizing. i got to switch who the home team is. Ah, look at that. So Emerson will be away. And JC will be home. Corey Nace will join me in the booth doing the scoreboard for game two. I think we have everything updated now. And let's take a look at the starting lineup for the second game. After NJCU pounded out 16 hits in game one, giving up just three as five pitchers. Did the job for the Gothic Knights. The bats have come around early this year, and the pitching is there. For the Gothic Knights, it'll be Bill Fian leading off. It's actually the exact same order, basically, as our last game. Bill Fian leading off and playing left field. Mike Ramirez batting second and playing center. Dan Berardi, the first baseman, hits third. And Lennon Gomez is the designated hitter and cleanup hitter. Tom Pulsini bats fifth and plays second base. Nick Legato had three hits in the last game. His average is sensational right now, and he bats six. Juan Pena had a three-run homer in the third inning to break it open. Well, he'll be back in right field batting seventh with Jesse Kraft at third base hitting eighth, and Jan Castellano, the catcher, batting ninth. Nate Facey will throw to Castellano behind the plate at first base. Berardi second base. Polsini, shortstop, Legato, third base, Kraft, the outfield, Fian, Ramirez, and Pena. That's your Gothic Knight batting order and defensive alignment for Emerson. Some changes, as you would imagine, after they dropped the opener, but not as many as you would think. Tim Quidadamo leads off and plays center field. Neil Perry's into the game for the first time, third baseman, batting second. Joe Palladino, the shortstop, bats third. And Pablo Feldman, the catcher and the cleanup hitter. Joe Cuccio's the first baseman, hitting fifth. Cam Beattie, who had a pinch hit base hit in the last game, will he'll be the designated hitter batting sixth. Meanwhile, Nolan Megna bats seventh and plays right field. John Gabberts, the second baseman, hitting eighth. And C.J. Rogers, the left fielder, batting ninth. Defensively, I'll give it to you one more time, but now for the Lions. Jack Fox, who was one of our scoreboard operators in the last game, he'll be the pitcher in this game, throwing behind the plate to Pablo Feldman. The infield is Cuccio at first, second base is Gabbert, third base is Perry, the shortstop Paladino, and in left field, it'll be Rogers, Quidadamo, and Magna. And the first pitch of the game to Quidadamo from the junior, Nate Facey, is a foul ball. Let me just make one change here so designated hitter shows up on your stats if you're watching at home. Fastball by Facey is a called strike. And quickly ahead, 0-2. Facey, junior right-hander out of North Brunswick, New Jersey. He is an accounting major. Popped in the air. Fair territory. Berardi coming in. And middle of the infield grass makes the catch. So, one away will be Neil Perry stepping to the plate. Corey Nace trying to learn the scoreboard on the fly and looking good so far. 
Nace has worked on and off of our office over the years. He would have worked more, but seems to like to go home and work in Tom's River instead. Perry is senior out of Middleborough, Massachusetts. And fly ball foul off to our right. Facey's had an interesting role through his career. He's been an on and off starter. That's lined up the middle. Diving is Pulsini. Can he get to his feet? The throw is wide. Just a great effort by Pulsini just to knock it down to begin with. He, if he had thrown him out, I mean, you're talking about da 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 da. And I'm sure he's disappointed, but man, what an athletic play by the junior transfer from Ocean County College. So an infield single. And with one away, Paladino will step in the shortstop. Paladino, sophomore at a Bedminster, New Jersey. Oratory prep, one of five by my math. Lions on this Emerson roster from New Jersey. Nate Facey was pounding the mound there, which was wet down between the first and second game. It's cooled down quite a bit. That ball's in the dirt and thrown into center field. So a wild pitch. Castellanos throw in the center field, but backed up nicely by Mike Ramirez, so there'll be no further advancement. And that's ball one. One out, man at second base. Facey looking over at Perry, deals inside, and it's 2 and 0. I'm going to try to make a quick adjustment to the camera. I'm realizing there's a little extra real estate that we don't necessarily need to show on a one camera shot here to the right of first base. So hopefully that shows a little bit more of the shortstop gap. And unfortunately we're not at home so I don't have a camera operator so we have to leave it as is throughout the broadcast and rely on me to actually be able to paint the picture. Two balls and one strike. It again has cooled down quite a bit. It was about 80 degrees when game one started. Checked my phone, it is now 69 degrees and obviously that's gonna go down even more as the night continues as the sun is down here in the Sunshine State. Called strike. Excellent representation by the NJCU families. I asked Coach Smith which families were here this trip and he said, well, the easier way to say it, who's not here? And it was very, very few people who couldn't make it. Swung on and missed. And for a team of 30 players, that says something about the culture and atmosphere of a program that has gone up leaps and bounds in the seven years under head coach Jerry Smith. Not even remotely the same program it used to be. And that you can see now with the results on the field. Ground ball through the right side. That's a base hit. Coming up with it is Pena. He's going to fire to Berardi, the cutoff man. And that quick reaction by Pena means Perry has to stop at third. And there are runners on the corners. But already with two hits for Emerson, after they had just one early in the first few innings of game one, and then three for the entire contest. Looks like the live stats are not kicking in. Oh, they are kicking in. I just had to refresh the page. There you go. And the offering by Facey to Feldman, the catcher. It's ball one. It's 
Swung on him. Fouled off the catcher. You get the umpire? No, I got the umpire, not the catcher. I thought I got the umpire first, and he's going to need a moment. Empire here is Ed Collins. He was in the field in game one. And David Gray is the field umpire. And Collins is down on one knee. And the Gothic Knights are going to bring him some water. That's Sean Gibney coming over. I don't know if you can see it on your screen. Show the umpire. And the athletic trainer for Emerson has come over to offer him some assistance too. He probably got caught in, you know, a certain location. And he'll need a moment. Count will be one in one when we come back. For those just tuning in, it's been a heck of a day for Broadcasting on Gothic Vision, I started the day in Fort Myers. I did both NJCU softball games down there, losses to, to Albion and Drew. Got back in the car after driving down there last night, drove two and a half, two hours, 45 minutes here, got here about 15 minutes before the game, was able to get the stats going at least. Obviously, it takes a little while to set up a broadcast, and we were able to hop on the air just before Juan Pena went yard in the third inning. Could not have timed that any better. So, Ed appears to be all right. Gets a nice round of applause. And when we restart here, as Castellano and Feldman both joke around with Ed Collins, the umpire. That's why being an official is hard, but it's sometimes even harder in a sport like this where you least expect that you can get nailed. Throw down to second base. Emerson trying for these. Rundown play. And he is out. So that goes down as a 2 4 3 caught stealing. As Castellano threw down to Pulsini and eventually a swipe tag by Berardi. Perry was never able to capitalize. So a 2-4-3 caught stealing. And now two balls and one strike. But the Gothic Knights got an out they needed. Now just a runner at third. And Fancy has a chance to get out of the inning right here. Off the handle of the bat foul ball back towards us. Count even at 2-2. Two and two. NJCU 2-0 to start the year. 6-2 and 14-1 have been the scores. Obviously they can hit, but the pitching has been there. And the pitching's there right now as Nate Facey strikes out Feldman. And the Gothic Knights get out of a mini jam here in the top of the first. In the first for Emerson. No runs, two hits. They strand one. NJCU coming up.
And we're back here in Fort Myers, Ira Thor, uh, Fort Myers. You can tell how long of the day this has been, man. Corey Nace, I don't even know what town I'm in anymore. We're in Auburndale, Florida. Nowhere near the coast. But Bill Fian, after having multiple hits in the last game, will step in to lead this one off for the Gothic Knights. You know, Corey, I've been, I've been in Fort Myers. I've been in Orlando. I think I have to take a pit stop in Miami tonight just to, to finish the triangle. About a three hour ride. I think it's doable. So Fien will step in. And the sophomore out of Point Pleasant fouls that one away, hitting 222 on the year. But man, he had a good game after having an 0 for 5 effort in the first game this year. Had a real solid effort in game two of the season. That was game one of this doubleheader against Emerson. That's a called strike in the outside corner. The 0 2. Curve. And that's high. Pitching this game, Jack Fox, sophomore out of Los Angeles, California. Cleveland High School, so he's familiar with this warmer weather that you have down here in Florida. And Fien, after being behind 0-2, does what he normally does. Makes the pitcher work, and he works the count full. The 3-2 is low, and Bill Fien does it again. So a leadoff walk by Fien. Amazingly, that's his first walk of the season in three games. Fien walked 27 times a year ago to lead the team. Led the team substantially in that category. Nobody else was even remotely close. And if I remember correctly, at one point prior to the NCAA tournament, he was actually leading the NJAC. Get on base any way you can. Mike Ramirez, an O1 pitch, Fats fouled away over the backstop and goes down the hill to the field behind us. Ramirez hitting 250 at a pair of doubles in our first game. Curve is high. Ground ball to second base. Bobbled. Could have been two, and the Gothic Knights will have everyone safe. An error at second base. And can the Gothic Knights capitalize now with two men on and nobody out? Only able to be handled there by Gabbert. That's his second error of the doubleheader. And you have to think that he was actually thinking two there in one of those situations of mind working faster than your body. Dan Berardi steps in. Ground ball, shortstop. This could be two. Six, four, three, and it is. So, Ramirez is erased. Fien goes to third, and now there's two away. Berardi swinging at the first pitch. So two away, and we'll see if Lennon Gomez is able to drive in the go-ahead run here in the bottom of the first inning. Gomez hitting 429 through the first two games. Curve is called strike. A 
that also called strike. So Fox ahead. No balls and two strikes. That's high. Fox last year, 2.52 ERA, 2 and 5 overall record in eight appearances, including seven starts. He threw three complete games, so I think it's reasonable to think he would have a chance to do so today in a game that's only seven innings. 50 innings pitch, he gave up 56 hits, struck out 26, walked just 14. And just off the plate. And for the second time in this inning, the Gothic Knights are able to work the count full. This will be the 17th pitch of the inning by Fox. The 3-2 by the right-hander. Swung on and missed. And he strikes out Gomez to end the inning. So Fox overcomes that 3-2 count. Feenan who walked the lead off the inning, is stranded at third. No runs, no hits, one error, one left on base. One inning books here, not in Fort Myers, we're actually in Auburndale. We'll be back. Now, when you're on these spring trips, you're out of the office for three or four days, and there's good things and bad things. And you know, good thing is you get to see some baseball and softball. You're in the sunshine. You're not sitting at your desk. Problem is, you also aren't checking your emails. And I just looked at my emails for the first time on a Monday. <laughs> 131. <laughs> Yeah, that's sensational. 131 emails. I should have put the out of office greeting on. It'll be the five, six, and seven hitters due out for the Lions here in the top of the second inning. It'll be Cuccio, Beatty. And Megna as the new Mac representatives in this game. Look to get on the board first against Nate Facey. Gothic Knights so far. Pitching has looked extremely strong thus far this year. And with a bunch of juniors and seniors, I think 10 of the 13 pitchers are juniors or seniors. That's going to make a big difference come NJAC tournament time. The NJAC, arguably the best conference in the country from top to bottom. It's proven in the NCAA tournament. And the Knights haven't made the playoffs in a number of years. And it's funny because outside the league, NJC has been 21-5 up north against non-NJAC teams. But just haven't found a way to break through in the league. Maybe this will be the year. You know common thought I've heard over the years that if you put the Knights in basically any other league in the country, maybe with a couple exceptions here and there, that they'll be a playoff team every year. If you can break through in the end, Jack, you can win in any league. And hopefully the pitching is there this year where that can finally come to fruition that this program will be a postseason bound. But still early in the year, just third game. We'll see if the pitching can hold up. We know the hitting will be there. It was there last year, and a lot of those pieces are back with some huge additions. 3-0 pitch is low. Well, Facey, a little rocky way to start the second inning. His first walk given up as he walks Beatty. I didn't say Beatty. Walked Cuccio, and Beatty comes to the plate. Looking ahead a little too much.
Looks like the video feed is substantially better this game, so after trying a number of different possibilities in terms of resolution, I think we finally found one that works. Five straight balls here to start the inning as that is high to Beatty. And Beatty is sophomore from Gilbert, Arizona. Round ball, short stop, Legato gets the force. Has a 1-0 pitch. And then a fielder's choice, and Cuccio's retired 6-4. So one away to bring up the right fielder, Nolan Megna. Senior out of Buffalo, New York. Emerson has players from all over the country and a few from all over the world, including one from Hong Kong. Very fine film and media school and one of the most notable alum is Dennis Leary. Liner at the go and he makes the catch! And a double play! Wow! Nick Legato skies to pull it down and then frozen at first base was Beatty. And I think anybody would have been frozen in that situation. What a play by Nick Legato. And they double up the Lions to end the inning. Simply sensational. So an L6-3 double play, Beatty's retired. And man, I wish we had another camera where we could have zoomed in a little bit there because that was, without a doubt, a top 10 caliber play. Legato sky there to pull that down. One of the best plays you will ever see from a shortstop. Showing off his vertical there. No runs, no hits, nobody left. We head to the bottom of the second here in Auburndale. We're still, uh, we're still smiling about that play by Legato. The other middle infielder, Tom Pulsini, steps to the plate. He's capable of making some pretty sensational plays, and we learned in the last game that the backups can do so too because Ryan Guthrie had a couple of just sensational stops diving in a hole. So there's some defense to be had in this team. We've seen there could be some pitching, and let's face it, we've been able to hit for years. That was never the issue. But can they put it all together for a 40-game slate? That's the challenge. And it starts here in Florida where you can actually get some games in without snow on the ground. Pulsini, liner to center field. And put Adamo's there for the out. 0-2 count. Corey Nace keeping me straight. Because I can't count the two apparently. So one out and a bring up the man with ups, Nick Legato. Uh, foul tip, Legato on the year. I know it's early, but the number still pops off the page, hitting 857. That's a good foul, a free throw shooting percentage if you. 
can do that. For a batting average, that's just ridiculous, even if it's just two games in. Well, just baseball, softball, men's volleyball, the only sports still in season. Men's basketball had a really fantastic 2018 season come to an end in the first round of the NCAA tournament. Losing game, they were up by 14 in the second half in the final few minutes. Legato in the air, carrying back in right center. And staying with it and making the catch was Quidadamo, and that was harder than it initially appeared. The wind carried a little bit back. So good job by Quidadamo staying with it. And it'll bring up Pena, the right fielder, who had a three-run homer to break open game one. He's hitting 333 on the year, the starting right fielder. So men's basketball finished 19 wins out in the first round of the NCAAs. Sam Tony, the NJAC player of the year. We expect him to be an All-American. And the entire team is back. They only lose two players, and both are reserves. Everybody else was a freshman, sophomore, junior, and there are a lot of pieces going to be added next year. You could bet that to see how far they can make a run. Their rival, Ramapo, is going to be in the Sweet 16 next weekend, and they're hosting the Sweet 16 in Mawa after they upset Williams on the road. Curves off the plate. And it's 2-2. Two and two. Women's basketball season's been over for a few weeks. Lined down the right field line, and going to roll all the way to the corner. Pena around first on his way to second. He will be there with a stand-up two-out double. So Pena was able to stay alive, and then he just rips one off the chalk down the line. Big round of applause from his first base coach, Raj Subramanian. And with two outs, we'll see if Jesse Kraft is able to keep it going. He's got a few doubles on the season himself. Now... I mentioned the winter sports because we I got word as I was driving here. I actually had stopped at McDonald's to get something to eat. And then I got a text from one of our women's bowlers about why they didn't compete this weekend. They got stuck on the bus for 18 hours with the highway shut down in Pennsylvania due to the nor'easter. Throw down the third. Pena, did he keep his hand on the bag? He did. It'll be a stolen base. And it'll be a ball and a strike to Kraft. 18 hours the bowling team got stranded on the bus. And obviously they didn't make it up to Buffalo for the AMCC tournament. So just found out about it. That's going to be a story I'm going to have the ladies tell. Because that is, man, a, uh, a survival story nonetheless. I mean, I couldn't spend 18 hours in a car if I'm driving. That's a call. Strike one and two as that slider's over the plate. But that was the end of the bowling season because that was the conference championship meet that they missed because of the storm. Wild pitch. Here comes Pena, and he's going to score standing. one nothing Gothic Knights. All this coming with two outs after the double and the steal by Pena, and the wild pitch brings them in. So the Gothic Knights strike first. And now Kraft bats with the bases empty and a little less stress. Sweet. Yeah. Strike three, looking, and the inning comes to a close. Great pitch there by Jack Fox to get Emerson out of the second inning. But in the second for the Gothic Knights, one run on one hit, the double, and eventual run scored by Pena. We head to the third, one nothing Gothic Knights in game two.
top of the third inning in Auburndale, Florida. Lake Merrill Sports Complex Field, numero five. And John Gabbert, the second baseman, will lead off. It'll be Gabbert, Rogers, and Quidadamo as the Lions, who have two hits but no runs, look to try to tie this one up here in the third inning. Again, remember, this is a seven-inning game as we are playing a doubleheader today. One ball, one strike by Facey. That's low. Tomorrow, NJCU will be in Lakeland, not too far from where the Detroit Tigers play. That'll be a 2.30 first pitch. And then they will play a 6 p.m. game, makeup of the game that they missed because of the flight being changed. Slow roller. Legato charges. He gloves it. He throws. He gets him. Nick Legato is making this look easier than it should be. So one out. And he'll bring up their left fielder, C.J. Rogers. Rogers is a junior out of Guilford, Connecticut. I usually like to talk about heights and stuff like that, but it's not listed on the Emerson roster, so I have to just say the hometowns. But it is impressive. They do draw nationally, and I mentioned in game one, not only are they, you know, obviously a great film school and media school, it's one of the schools I was actually looking at coming out of high school because of that program. Eventually opting to apply to Syracuse and Georgia and a few other broadcast programs and journalism programs, but one of the great professors I ever had was an Emerson graduate and Part of the reason I am where I am today is because of Arnie. If he's uh, Arnie Zulo, if he's watching this game, and he does tune in now and then to make sure I'm still alive. Ground ball to shortstop Legato again. Is he human? I just heard from the dugout. Where did we get him? Well, Spotswood, New Jersey, would be your answer. Top of the order will be Tim Quidadamo. So, if you're Emerson, I think it might be best to hit it somewhere else other than shortstop right now. Not that second base, third base, and first base aren't fielded well, but right now shortstop I don't think is an option anymore. That's low. Two and one to Quidadamo. I mean, if, and I'm looking right at Corey. If, if Legato plays like this in the end, Jack, you're talking about gold glove type year because that league just absolutely bleeds gold glove winners. Right back to Facey. He's going to walk it over himself and then a short flip to Berardi and the inning comes to a close. Great defense all around. Legato obviously leading the charge, but... Nate Facey showing he's not too shabby himself. As the Lions go in order, one, two, three, three ground balls. As we head to the bottom of the third, one nothing Gothic Knights.
Uh, we thank those of you watching today's game here on Gothic Vision. The stream has been a lot more successful and more stable in this contest than game one. I wonder if it's got anything to do with it being dark out and the way the signal carries, but happier that we have a better quality broadcast this time. Castellano, Fien, and Ramirez, the number nine, one, and two hitters do up for the Knights. Castellano, his first at bat of the game, hitting 286 on this young campaign. Fox deals. Ground ball, shortstop. That eats alive the shortstop as he was backpedaling initially anyway after misjudging it initially. And I have to give a, a single there to Castellano. That's just a tough play there. All right, double play, guys. And you saw Young trying to adjust and just wasn't able to do so. So uh, infield single, and Bill Fian will step to the dish. He walked and was stranded at third in the first inning. Fian, one of about eight shore players on this roster. And myself being a guy who lives basically in the shore area, it's always nice to see uh, guys from your own part of the state on the roster. None of them have asked me to give them a ride home yet, so that's a plus. One ball, two strikes here to Fian. Can the Gothic Knights, with a man on and nobody out, add to this lead? Swung on and missed. Fian goes down on strikes. And he, he gave that one is all. He swung all the way through that, kind of twisted his body up. Mike Ramirez due up. Got the Knights center fielder. Reached on an error in the first inning. We expect him on the mound at some point this week. But when that will be, only Jerry and Nick know. Jerry Smith, Nick Cesare. I'd imagine before this trip is over, everybody will have pitched at least an inning. You know, they've been very good over the years of getting the majority of the pitching staff. And it's hard sometimes because you've really got 16 guys total who can throw. And the majority of pitching staff, some work down here. Ground ball. Looked at second initially, but electing to go the short way was the second baseman, Gabbert. Castellano goes to second, but there's now two away. Right, so a 4-3 ground out, two away, brings up Dan Berardi. Berardi grounded into a 6-4-3 double play in his first at bat. Ground ball up the middle, that's a base hit. Castellano around third, he's being waved. Here's a throw to the plate, not in time. Berardi will advance on the throw. An RBI two out single by Dan Berardi. And the Knights lead to nothing. By my math, that is career RBI 62, I think, for Dan Berardi. So it's a single to middle and an RBI. He advances on the throw. Castellano scores. 2-0 NJCU. And Lennon Gomez steps to the plate. And Gomez, that is a long foul ball. Uh, the runs with two outs, Jerry Smith, Nick Cesare, the rest of the pitching staff love that. The rest of the coaching staff, I should say, love that. Talk about the runs scored with two outs all the time. It's a great stat and obviously a way to win ball games. One ball, two strikes. Berardi at second base. That's a wild pitch. Berardi around third. And that was strike three. So Gomez swinging at a ball in the dirt. 
I didn't realize at first that he swung until I saw him taken off to first base, but a strikeout wild pitch. And now runners on the corners, and the Gothic Knights get extra life. By the way, that is 62 RBI, so I actually for once was actually right with the stat. And that brings up Tom Pulsini. Pulsini, chopper, right in front of the plate, will carry him foul. Pulsini lined out to center to start the second inning. Gothic Knights with a chance to add another run with two outs. They've scored in the bottom of the second and third innings. And they have a 2 nothing lead. Two runs on three hits, no errors. No runs, two hits, one error for Emerson. Fast ball to the left-handed hitter on the outside corner. No balls and two strikes. After sitting the entire last game, I am standing this entire game, and Corey Nace is now joining me. Why? Because it's when you're sitting, I'm realizing it's really cold. For shorts, at least. Now, I'm sure everybody back in Jersey, Massachusetts, and around the country, when I say really cold, and I'm saying that in air quotes for Florida, is laughing at me, but it was 80 degrees, and it's probably about 60 now. Pulsini, ground ball to first base. It'll be an easy play there. And Feldman steps on the bag as the inning comes to a close on the three unassisted. Gomez and Berardi are stranded on the corners, but not before the Gothic Knights add another run on two hits. And they lead 2-0 after three innings. Top of the fourth inning here in Auburndale. Ira Thor with you on Gothic Vision. Corey Nates from our pitching staff on the scoreboard. And NJCU is leading on the scoreboard after winning game one, 14-1. They got single runs in the second and third innings and have a 2-0 lead as Nate Facey heads out for his fourth inning of work. have to give a shout-out to Alyssa McGee watching today's broadcast. Alyssa was a four-year women's volleyball player, super, uh, student athlete for the Gothic Knights with a 3.9, like, 8.7263 GPA. Something insane. And now is in a Ph.D. program in psychology at Fordham. She worked for me for four years. She may or may not be... Significant other of somebody on the baseball team, which is why she's interested in this game to begin with. But of course, we say hello to her, one of the great student assistants we've ever had. And I hear a rumor that her sister may be playing soccer with us next year, which would be nice. And of course, you know, if there's another McGee added to the NJCU family, they automatically have a job in my office, no questions asked. 
as long as they show up on time. And say yes and please. Neil Perry steps to the plate. He singled before being stranded at third base. That was the best scoring chance for Emerson in the first inning. The 2-2 pitch, ground ball off the mound. It's going to be too slowly hit for anybody to have a play. And as well as Legato and Pulsini have been doing, major leaguers aren't making that play. So a single to second base. Perry has two to three hits for Emerson, and Joe Palladino, the shortstop, who also singled, will step to the plate. Popped in the air, foul territory. Berardi, Pena over there. And Berardi makes the catch as he falls over Berardi, Pena. Like seriously, that just happened. Alyssa McGee will be happy about that. Dan Berardi making a sensational catch, trying to track it down. I don't think he heard Pena. They both are okay, and we have another highlight real caliber play. So an FF3 down the right field line. We say hello to Max Wildstein from Emerson watching the game, and thanks for some tidbits of information. We appreciate that. Pablo Feldman will step in now with one out, throw over the first, and Perry will dive in. Perry's father, Michael, is the first base coach. So two Perry's at first base. Throw back again, and diving in safely is Perry. One ball, no strikes, swung on and missed. Curve, nice pitch by Facey. And one ball and two strikes. Low. And it's two and two. Popped in the air. Foul territory. Castellano makes the catch. And that's out number two. Good communication there. You saw Nate Facey kind of pointing to his catcher where the ball was before he took the mask off and then just had to make the catch, and he did. So two away. Perry still at first base after the leadoff single, and it'll bring up the first baseman, Cuccio.
And that's a line drive to center field for a base hit. Ramirez is over, quickly gets to it to limit Perry to one base. But Cuccio keeps the inning alive. Fourth hit for Emerson. They have a 4-3 margin in hits right now after having just three hits in game one, but they trail 2-0. And that'll bring up the D.H. Cambady, who reached on a fielder's choice in the second inning. And he steps out. Time is granted. Care of a little social media posting as we had a slight delay. Facey deals and ground ball. Diving stop by Legato. Do you expect anything else? Nick Legato is playing on another planet right now, and the Gothic Knights get out of this inning. Cornelius is shaking his head. I'm speechless. I got to come up with some more adjectives for this young man. And we head to the bottom of the fourth. It's 2 0. Now we're back here for the bottom of the fourth inning, and Nick Legato, who is making a highlight reel by himself today, steps to the plate, hitting 750 on the year. The only thing he doesn't have today is a base hit, but let's see if he can change that. Low, one and one as I update our little score bug, which I'm actually remembering to do this game. Slider at the knees, and it's one and two. That's ripped in the air down the left field line. It's gonna roll all the way to the wall. Legato, a little slow to get around first, so he's going to have to stay at second with a double. But another double for Nick Legato. I'm running out of words. He's having one of the great games all around that I've seen in a long, long time by anybody in the NJAC period, let alone this program. So 
So a double to left field to lead off the inning. Juan Pena, who had a double and stole third before scoring the first run of this game and had a three-run homer in game one, steps to the dish. We'll see what the sophomore slash freshman right fielder does. That's chopped back to the mound. Fox is going to flip it to first for the short out. Legato stays. What's the count there, Corey? That was 1-0. See, the problem is you get a little older here is you have no short-term memory, but I can't blame that because I didn't have it back in my 20s either. Need to take some of these focus supplements. So one away, it'll be Kraft's turn at the plate. Fastball just a little bit high there by Fox, who's now thrown 57 pitches after a long first inning has kept his numbers down. Three balls here to Kraft. Popped in the air, foul, and over everybody's heads. I am really surprised that nobody, I won't say nobody, but very few people get hit by foul balls here because with the four fields basically in a circle here at the complex, there are foul balls flying out of here all the time. There goes Legato diving in the third aggressively with the steal. Meanwhile, that's ball four, and Kraft takes first. I mean, Legato right now is just playing, I'm, I'm trying to th think of the the term here, with because uh, there's a term that's being used, but I don't want uh, that to use sometimes when you're playing all out in sports. I don't want to use it, because I don't know if it's appropriate for the air, but he's playing at that level right now. Just reckless and bad, uh, so reckless uh, abandonment, like something like that. But yeah, you get you get my idea here. I mean, he he was airborne as he dove into third base. Love that level of aggressiveness, and that's how teams win championships when they have players that are leading. And Legato, there are no captains on this year's team. Haven't really been too many captains over the years. It's kind of just players assuming leadership roles as the year comes. That's kind of been the thing with Coach Smith's teams over the years. And, you know, that's something you have to earn as the year goes on. And I think Legato's kind of being one of those guys right now. Kafer, Kyle Kafer's been that for years. Kyle Kafer, is a starting pitcher for the Knights, of course, is the chair of the Student Athlete Advisory Council, so he's a leader on campus as a whole already so you have those guys around this program but this is, a, this is just a good group right now and they're starting to click in all cylinders early in the season not in March not in April like they did last year two years ago they won 13 games in March last year they barely played in March because it snowed every day or rained every day one or the other last year they had a dominant 13 win month of April and this year they're starting strong on their spring trip, which has kind of been where they have not started strong over the years. So Castellano's at the plate. One out, runners on the corners. Castellano hitting 375 in the season. Drops down a bunt, trying to squeeze home Legato. And he gets the RBI in the sack bunt. And the Gothic Knights now lead 3-0. So for Castellano, credit a fielder's choice sack bunt and an RBI. Kraft advances, Legato scores. 
Steal by Legato. Continuing to the run. That's the... Popped in the air. Ferrari makes the catch. So one away to bring up C.J. Rogers, also grounded out to shortstop. Back to Facey, he dives. Picks it up, throw to first. Couldn't get it initially, didn't give up on it. And that's two away. So Rogers on the bunt attempt there. Not a sacrifice because it was right back to the pitcher there. So they won three. That advances Magna to second. And back to the top of the order to Quidamo. In the dirt, Castellano down to third and moving up on the wild pitch as it took Castellano a moment to try to find that. So the second time that the Lions have had a runner at third base, last time he was stranded, and that will result in a quick visit from pitching coach Nick Cesare. Cesare, not only is he the coach of our 16-member pitching staff, he also saves me a ton of money every year in terms of baggage on these trips because all the equipment we need to broadcast these games, if I tried to check it, not only would I be nervous about that because, you know, airlines break stuff, it would be pretty costly. But Nick, not a fan of flying, likes driving a lot better, and every year he drives the van down from Jersey to Florida. All the bats are in there, so we don't have to check them. And I put all the broadcast equipment in there. So it's been really convenient over the last seven years. Now, he did fly, of course, when the team went to Puerto Rico. I think that was two years ago. Is your freshman year record? It would be a little difficult to drive the van to Puerto Rico. Popped in the air, foul. And it's one and two. And if the team goes to another location other than Florida in the future, there's talk of maybe Texas or Arizona or California at some point down the line. If fundraising dollars are there, obviously that would be a much further drive as well. Doable, but I think, I think Nick would probably fly that time. Two balls, two strikes. Facey trying to get out of the inning. That's high. And it's three and two. Full count. Facey deals low and it's a two out walk. Second walk giving up this inning. Facey's only thrown 66 pitches. Well, for the first time today, command hasn't been as sharp as it was earlier. So with two outs and runners on the corners, Neil Perry steps in representing the tying run in a 3-0 game for the Gothic Knights.
And I think that's going to be it for Nate Facey as Jerry Smith, the head coach for the Gothic Knights, looking for his 96th career win. And he's going to take the ball from Facey, and that'll be it. Nate Facey, a fine performance. If the Gothic Knights can hold this lead in line to be the winning pitcher, of course, in a seven-inning game, you only have to throw four innings. And the junior from North Brunswick gets a round of applause from both fans, both NJCU and Emerson, on a finely pitched game. And we'll see Dan Foley coming in. So Foley, the new pitcher, the senior out of Tom's River. I used Foley's picture in the game story recap yesterday because in the win over Pitt Greensburg, he came into the game with the bases loaded. I think it was the seventh inning. And he struck out the potential tying run. Big moment for Foley. For those who don't know his story, Foley is a member of the Army National Guard. He misses one weekend a month because of National Guard responsibilities. And obviously when you're an outdoor athlete, you're playing double headers on the weekend, sometimes double headers both days. So you know, he's missing an, some action because of his commitment to this country. And we obviously salute everything that Dan does. He's the oldest member of this team at age 24, and obviously that is a big part because of his military commitment. Foley out of Tom's River East. So for those who don't know Tom's River, there are three high schools. Tom's River East, we have two representatives, Dan Foley, Matt Corsi. East is where I think we're, uh, oh, I'm getting a big thumbs down here. That's where, um, oh my God, Frazier went. Frazier went to South? I thought he played for East in the Little League. Oh, they're throwing me off here. All right. Well, Foley and, and Matt Corsi went to Tom's River East. Corey Nace and Anthony Carrefour went to Tom's River South, which now I've just learned after all these years where Jeff Frazier of the Mets, Yankees, Red Sox, what did I say? Well, Jeff and Todd. And um, where else did he play? White Sox went to school. Tom's River North is the other one, right? And we've got to add somebody from Tom's River North to complete the set. That'd be like having only just three high schools in Hamilton. That'd be like only having from Steiner and Hamilton and not having anybody from, I don't know, Nottingham. Well, Foley in a situation here with runners on the corners and Perry at the plate. Round ball foul. Magna had to leap out of the way of that one to avoid being hit. And it's one and one. Feels like I'm forgetting somebody. I thought there was a fifth from Tom's River. Oh, there's only four. Throw down to third, or second base, I should say. But advancing on, I guess that was a wild pitch. As that ball was in the dirt. That's ball two. Yeah, only only four. I thought there was a fifth for some reason. Of course, you know we have Kyle McCabe from Brick, New Jersey. That's you know basically Tom's River North, or as we say in in Hal Hal South, basically an extension of Ramtown. And of course we got Bill Fian from Point Pleasant, which you know who doesn't love Point Pleasant. Two balls and one strike now. Two runners in scoring position. Ground ball. And that's going to slide through the left side. Magnus scores. Quidadamo 
to the plate. And on the throw, Perry advances to second. It's a two-run single for Emerson. And they cut the deficit in half. It's three to two. So a single through the left side, two RBIs for Perry. And now it's a one-run game, and that's going to be it for Foley. He was able to get the job done yesterday in a pressure situation, but couldn't make it two for two. And we'll have a new pitcher. It'll be well, somebody from Tom's River. It'll be Anthony Carfora when we come back. So Anthony Carfora, who struck out the side looking in his performance, as I adjust my mic, in game one today, Carfora actually got credited with the win because Zaccaro didn't go far enough in a seven-inning game to qualify. And fouled back towards us. Ball and a strike. Two runs here in the top of the fifth for Emerson. They've shaved this deficit down to one. It's three to two. Tying run at second base. Nice pitch by Carr. Four just off the plate. Throw down to second. And Perry's back safely. That's high. Car four needs one out. Fastball right down the middle. Interesting note about Carr 4, by the way. If you watch him, he has to adjust his hat after every pitch. 
He's got such a thick head of hair right now, his hat is actually shifting when he throws. And a, a time is called because a foul ball from the game to our left just bounced right behind home plate. Three two. That's in the air to left field. Back goes Bill Fien on the run over his head. This will tie the game. Perry scores. On his way to second and racing around to third is Palladino. The throw to third, not in time. Actually, off of the glove. Off of the glove of a diving craft. It's a triple. It's backed up by Carfora. And Emerson has tied this game here in the fifth. So Palladino drills that one to deep left field, and we're not at three. And now Carrefour has to retire the out because the go-ahead run is at third. Curve is wide. Check swing off the end of that right to car four, and the inning does finally come to a close. But not before Emerson is able to tie the game. He runs on two hits, a strand one, the Gothic Knights. Do up in the bottom of the fifth looking to untie it. So for the first time today, the Gothic Knights are dealing with adversity. First time really on the trip as a whole, as they are now tied with Emerson at 3-3, facing their ace, Jack Fox. And Mike Ramirez, Dan Berardi, Lennon Gomez, the two, three, and four hitters in the heart of this lineup step up. Here in the fifth, first, Ramirez. 0 for 2 today. Ground ball, second base. And... He is thrown out by the second baseman, Gabbard. So a 4-3 ground out, one away. It'll bring up Dan Berardi. Berardi had a RBI single in the third. That's off the plate. Dan Berardi, 62 Career RBIs. That's in the air. 
Straight away, center field. On the run. And bounces over the wall, or is it gone? It's a double. It's a ground rule double. At the very last second, lost track of it. Berardi thinks it's gone. Well, head coach Jerry Smith comes out to argue it. I don't, I mean, I lost track of that at the very last second, whether clear defense. Quidadama reacted immediately, so I'll give him the benefit of the doubt there that, that it was a ground rule double. But off the bat from Berardi, and I've seen him hit a lot of long home runs in his career, that kind of had the same feel to it. But now the Gotham Mets will have to do it the hard way. Set a tie in the game, Dan Berardi with the long ground rule double. What's the count there? It was 1-0. Corey Nace knows the counts. I don't. So double a center ground rule. Lennon Gomez, who's hit a lot of extra base hits in his young career. We'll see if he can put the Gothic Knights ahead. For Berardi, that is his 26th career double. If I can remember the record book correctly that will put him either fifth or sixth all time and he's played with the top two all time in Alex Weinstein and Andrew Nish in fact he was behind Weinstein at first base former all-conference player and part of that is one of the reasons that Berardi actually ended up being a DH for a little bit his first couple years. You, you had to keep both bats in the lineup. They were too good. But only one guy could be at first. Alex Weinstein, by the way, lives now in Florida full-time. He is a cop in just... Became a cop in Doral, Florida, down by Miami. One of the great little towns in Florida. One of the, I think one of the safest towns in the state. So... Having Alex Weinstein on the force, I guess that allegedly would make you safer. And Lennon in the air! Deep right center field! That one bounces over the wall. This time we saw it all the way. Gomez ties the game. Got a correction, gives the Knights the lead on back-to-back -back long ground rule doubles by the Gothic Knights. That one off his bat just absolutely carried before finally being knocked down a little bit by the win at the end. Sensational hitting by the three, four hitters in this lineup. And another foul ball lands on our field. So Lennon Gomez on a 1-1 pitch with a Double to right center, ground rule driving in Berardi. And the Gothic Knights lead four to three, and that's gonna be it for Jack Fox. He pitched a great game, and he gets a round of applause as the LA native comes out of the game, actually down a run, but he definitely threw a fantastic effort to try to keep his Lions in it. We'll take a quick break. As the new pitcher, number 13, Ethan Young, warms up.
So the new pitcher was the shortstop in game one. And that is Ethan Young. And with one out, and the Gothic Knights now back on top four to three. Young, the junior out of Amherst, Mass. And first pitch is a wild pitch. So Pulsini steps in, first pitch by Young, goes wild, and that pushes Gomez to third base. NJCU hasn't had as many hits anywhere near as they did in the first game when they had 16. However, of their six hits in this game, four are doubles, including back-to-back -back round rule doubles by Berardi and Gomez. When the Knights do make contact, they make serious contact. They had eight extra base hits in game one. And it's two and one. Pulsini lines that one deep and foul down the right field line. that point in the game where standing up hurts, but I don't want to sit down. Swung on and missed, and Pulsini strikes out. So two outs, Lennon Gomez still at third, and some really good defensive player, they Nick Legato will step to the plate. Legato, one for two with a double and a run scored in the fourth, and he's made basically every highlight reel play you could ever imagine at shortstop all on the same night. Check, swing, foul tip, strike one. Off the plate, one and one. That's high, ball two. And that's lined the left field. That's going to fall in for a base hit to score Gomez for the fifth run. An RBI two out single by Nick Legato. And the Knights back on top by two. So up steps Juan Pena. Pena lines that one down the right field line. That is going to be a fair ball all the way to the wall. Logano around second on his way to third. He's being weighed by Harry Smith. Pena to third. It's a triple. The Knights lead 6-3. They get the runs back. I think that was the first pitch to Pena. Oh. 
Second pitch. And that one went all the way to the wall. So a triple to right field. Legato scores. After giving up three runs in the top of the inning, the Knights say, thank you very much. We'll take him back. And that will bring up Kraft. The Knights have four hits in this inning. Three of them are extra base hits. They have eight hits in this game. Four doubles and a triple. And JC is not getting little slow rollers to shortstop. They are hitting the heck out of the baseball to start this season. In all three games they've played. Low. Pena, by the way, has a double and a triple in this game. He has a homer in the first game, so he's showed up to play for sure. Uh, foul ball, and it's going to land in the concourse area safely away from everybody. Of course, Pena transfer from Division I rider. Didn't play there, so technically he's actually eligible for rookie of the year. Foul tip, and it's going to go to the backstop. I put him up for and Jack Rookie of the Week, but that was a long shot because we only played one game. But hey, I've, we've won before with one game, so I, somebody's got the numbers, I'll put them up and let the assistant commissioner decide. That is popped up down the left field line and coming over a long run to make the catch by Rogers, and the inning finally comes to an end. Pena stranded at third, but the Gothic Knights get the runs back. Three runs on four hits. They leave one. Sixth inning coming up in Auburndale, 6-3 in JCU. Top of the sixth inning, Anthony Carrefour is out. He's actually in line to win for the second time today. He won the first game in relief, and he is the pitcher of record when NJCU regained the 6-3 lead, even though he did give up a base hit. But eh, Carrefour could be one of the rare pitchers in the history of the program to win twice in the same day. I don't know if it's ever been done. I don't even know how to figure it out if it's ever been done. 
Kyle Kafer, who threw a little bit yesterday, and his mom and dad are on the trip, or as are many of the parents, and Kyle Kafer comes in to throw the six. We also have a very unconventional move at third base. Jesse Kraft's day is done at third, and Jose Ortiz, who is the winning pitcher on day one of this trip, is playing third base for the first time in his career, and Cornet says he's been doing this in practice, and has been doing it well, so you're going to give it a shot. He's been playing some good defense at third. That's hit in the air to deep left field. Bill Fiend's going to chase that wall all the way to the fence on the 1-1 pitch to Cucci, uh, Cuccio to start this inning, and he's clearly happy at second base. Looking like he's throwing down the gauntlet. That, that dance move looks like. So a double to left to start the sixth inning. Six runs, eight hits for the Knights, no errors. Emerson, three runs, now seven hits and one error. And it'll be Cam Beatty, the designated hitter, stepping in. Late night here in Auburndale. Don't play again tomorrow till 2.30 and softball is off tomorrow. Chopper to third. Here comes Ortiz. Throw to first is not in time. So it's going to be an infield single. Ortiz had to come in and, and make a great play just to glove it and to have any chance to throw out Beatty, and he couldn't do so. So credit Beatty with an infield single. Up the third base line. Cuccio advances on the throw. And now, suddenly Emerson has the tying run at the plate again. Kafer, the Gothic Knight ace, just trying to get some work in on this trip. On a long double, and now a slow roller to third base and Megna steps to the plate one and one throws back to first and Beatty's in The 1-1, one, one. that's low, in the dirt, 2-1. and one. We thank those of you watching this game here on Gothic Vision. I Thor with you live from Auburndale, Florida. Game 3 of 6 on this spring trip for the Gothic Knights. 2-0 on the year. Emerson looking for their first win of the season. Just off the plate, Castellano did a good job of framing it, but it was a sh tad wide. And it's three and one. That's no doubt about it, and it's three and two. Just a reminder, this is a seven inning game. The first game was seven innings as well. And that's fouled off to our right. Kyle Kafer has worked in my office for four years. He may come back as a graduate student to play his last year of eligibility next year. And if he does, he'll work in my office again. He will have a job until he's no longer on campus because he does a great job. Ortiz dives. Legato dives. It splits the difference, and a run comes in. Magna is able to split the difference. Magna was able to slide it between a diving Ortiz and a diving Legato. No chance for either. And it's now six to four. Beatty, of course, goes to second on that as Cuccio scores. One RBI. And still nobody out.
And John Gabbert, the second baseman, will step in. Kafer from Bordentown, New Jersey. One of many Philadelphia Eagle fans that I am, unfortunately, surrounded with in my office. Joe Cohen, our head soccer coach, is from South Jersey as well. And uh, when uh, Eagles won the Super Bowl, Coach Cohen, I have... Outside my office, I have pictures of Eli Manning and Victor Cruz and the, the last Giants Super Bowl championship from a few years ago. And uh, the next day, Coach Cullen did an awesome job of trolling me. He took pictures of the Eagles Super Bowl championship and taped them over. He didn't tape them on it, so he didn't ruin the pictures, but he taped them over the pictures. And it took me about half the day to realize that he had trolled me. It was perfectly done and absolutely hilarious. And obviously one of the fun things about being in our office is just some of the personalities we have on the coaching staff. Something you don't have at every school. Not only am I a diehard Giants fan, I also announce in the press box on game day, so a little extra love for the New York Giants, but I gave Kafer and his family the, uh, they, they get the pass here because they're awesome that they're allowed to wear the Eagle swag around the office. Magna's at first, Beatty's at second. They represent the potential tying runs for Emerson. Gabbard is 0 for 2 today. Ground out to shortstop on a great play by Legato, and then they pop up to first base. The 0 2. Swung on and missed strike three. Kafer fans Gabbard. So one away. And C.J. Rogers, the left fielder, will step in. He's 0 for 2 in this contest. They ground out to short also. And a ground ball back to the pitcher. Dropping down the bunt. Kafer comes over the field. It throws. The sacrifice is effective. Is it, I don't know. Should that be a sacrifice? He didn't give himself up. He kind of just went for the single. I don't think that's a sacrifice. What do you think, Corey? You should, I give him a sack? Uh, Corey thinks that should be nice. All right, I'll give him the sack. I'm being generous here. I don't know about that. The more I think about it. But he does advance the runners, and I guess that was the purpose here. So... Tying runs are both now in scoring position. And that's the center fielder, Tim Quidadamo, stepping to the plate. He had a walk and a run scored in the fifth, otherwise 0 for 2. 0 1 pitch coming by Kafer. That's fouled off. And Kafer now a strike away from getting out of this inning. Kyle Kafer, senior, criminal justice major from Bordentown. The 0-2, that's high. During basketball games this year, Kafer was the spotter for us doing stats for virtually every game. He's done basically everything you could think about at the score table for a basketball game through his four years at NJCU. The 1-2, that's high. Done the shot clock, done the official book. He's had basically all the important jobs because we trust him because we know he's going he's gonna to do it well, and he always has. And he's also pitched really well for three years. He has a fourth year because he got hurt his freshman year, and that's why he is seriously considering coming back and also going to grad school. And I know he wants to be a cop at some point and even gets his master's 
know, his long-term goal probably would be to become a lieutenant or something like that or a detective, and that would certainly help his case as well. Swung on and missed! Castellano will have to throw down the first to complete the play, and they do. And runners are stranded in scoring position as the Gothic Knights get out of it here in the top of the sixth. So KS2-3, Megna and Beatty are stranded in scoring position. A run on three hits, but they leave two. Bottom six coming up, the Gothic Knights looking for insurance, leading 6-4. So Castellano retired 6-4. Berardi will step in now with two outs. Swung on and missed. Berardi chasing that one. Foul tip there. And it's 0-2. So Ramirez at first. Inning extended, of course, by the error a little bit ago. It's short. Can the Gothic Nets capitalize and add an insurance run? Round ball, second base. The flip is short for the force. And the inning comes to a close on the ground ball to second base. Ramirez retired six, uh, four to six. So one error and one left on base. We will head to the seventh inning. Kyle Kafer looking for the save. Gothic Knights lead 6-4. So the Gothic Knights need three outs to improve to 3-0. and And Kyle Kafer looking for the two-inning save. That's low. One ball and one strike to Perry. It'll be Perry, Palladino, and Feldman, the two, three, and four hitters. Perry's had a nice game. He's three for three. With two RBIs and a run scored, he has three of the eight hits. 
One ball, two strikes. Off the end of the bat, foul remains one and two. We say hello to my assistant, Phil Nagley, watching this game back in Jersey. Phil should be on this trip, but apparently he had a midterm or something to take for his graduate class, so that's why I'm driving all over the state like a crazy person. Ground ball up the middle. That's going to find its way through. Completely split the difference there between Pulsini and Legato. Neither had a chance. And the leadoff man is on. Perry's four for four. So Palladino comes up. He actually represents the tying run. Had my sunroof open in the rental on the way to the field. I have a feeling it will not be open on the way back. Alyssa McGee texts me and says she would gladly would have accepted a trip to Florida in place of Phil, who declined. Maybe someday. Now 62 degrees. Which is normally obviously a very comfortable baseball temperature, but not as comfortable to be wearing shorts in. Popped in here, foul. He'll be out of play. One and one. It actually hit the top of the backstop on the field behind us. And then one of the kids on the trip chases that one down for us. Inside at the knees. Good spot by Kafer. And it's one and two. The senior lefty from Bordentown trying to lock this inning down for the Knights. Check swing. He did not go around, so it'll be two and two. Perry, who led off with a single, he's at first. Ground ball, this could be two. Legato flips to Pulsini. The throw is in time. Six, four, three. Perfectly turned there by Legato and Pulsini, who three games into the season are in perfect tandem work together. And you can tell that the work that they did throughout the preseason paying off already. And Emerson down to its final out. And it'll be the catcher Feldman. And a called strike. Feldman in this game. Strike out, a foul out, and a line out. Outside corner, strike two. And the Lions are now down to their final strike. The Gothic Knights looking to win twice today and three times in three games to open this trip. That's high. And Anthony Carrefour is the pitcher of record, so if uh, this holds up, he will win twice on one day in relief. The one-two. Strike three looking on the outside corner. Kafer pumps his fist. And the Gothic Knights win 6-4. to four. NJCU with a doubleheader sweep of Emerson today. A convincing win in 14-1 to fashion in Game 1. But they had to work for it here in Game 2 after Emerson put up three runs in the top of the fourth to tie the game. NJCU answered with three runs in the bottom of that inning, including back-to-back -back round rule doubles by Dan Berardi and Lenin Gomez, and that contributed to our final score today.
as New Jersey City beats Emerson 6-4. to The Gothic Knights, six runs, eight hits, and no errors. Emerson actually ended up with more hits, four runs and ten hits, and two errors. But NJCU in the win column once again. They improved to 3-0 on what is certainly a very promising season for this NJCU squad as they win today. And they will play two tomorrow as well when we move to Hanley Field in Lakeland for games against Albion and a makeup with SUNY Poly. Take a look at the final stats from this one. For NJCU, Nick Legato is the star of this game, no doubt about it. Two for three, two runs scored, and some incredible defense. Some of the best I've ever seen, including six assists. He also had a double. Pena, two for three with a double, a triple, an RBI, and a run scored. Dan Berardi was two for four with an RBI and a double. Len Gomez, one for three with a double. And NJCU in the win column yet again. We'll be on the air tomorrow. Probably about, oh, maybe 2.15, 2.20 for a 2.30 start against Albion. Kyle Kafer gets the save. Jerry Smith is amped up in left field. We'll sh close our broadcast by showing that conversation out there. They are excited as they should be because this team right now is special and they're 3-0 to start the year. Carfora with the win. Kafer with the save. The Knights move to 3-0. And we thank everyone for watching this game and all four games today on Gothic Vision. We started the day about... Oh, 12 and a half hours ago in Fort Myers. We did both softball games in Fort Myers. Drove almost three hours up here to Auburndale. Did both games here against Emerson. And I'm going to go get some dinner because I'm starving. But the Gothic Knights with the doubleheader sweep. And we'll be back to do it again tomorrow right here in Central Florida. On behalf of everyone at NJSU Athletics, and thanks to Corey Nace, who was on the scoreboard to help us out here in game two. And we also have to thank the two members of the Emerson squad, Sam Knox and Jack Fox. Fox is the losing pitcher in Game 2, but both helped us out on the scoreboard in Game 1, and we appreciate and want to acknowledge their assistance. On behalf of everyone at NJCU Athletics, I'm Ira Thor. Thanks for watching today's four games, including both here of NJCU Emerson Baseball and Auburndale. Until we talk to you tomorrow, be well, everybody.